Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of MotorOne.com, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. By the end of 2019, no fewer than 25 vehicles on sale today will be discontinued. That's a lot, and while some of them will miss, for the most of them, well, they deserve the axe. On today's episode, we're going through the list of dead cars walking with an eye towards which cars we'd save and which cars we'd recommend take their place. Joining me again this week is MotorOne.com senior editor and possible future owner of a Dodge Dakota Shelby edition truck I really wanted to buy, Jeff Perez. How you doing, Jeff? Good, John. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Also with us is writer and my fellow Ohioan, Chris Bruce. How you doing, Chris? Doing well. Glad to be back. Awesome. So today, uh, our episode today is inspired by a article we did um, that we do every year um, about the cars uh, being killed. And this one um, started out, I probably started out as the 10 cars being killed this year. And we add to it like every two weeks, there's, there's a couple more cars announced that are being killed off. Right now, the number is at 25 vehicles being killed for uh, by the end of 2019. That number may be 26 by the end of this podcast. Well, we're, we're actually trying to find out. Um, so it's a pretty big list, but this happens every year. This is part of the churn of of the whole fleet of vehicles on sale in the U.S. So what we want to do today is go through that list, that 25, those 25 cars, and let you know each and every one that will be uh, going away. After we're done with that, since this list is a little controversial among our group, we want to play a little game where we pick the cars that we would save off the list that we would prevent from dying. However, in order to do that, a sacrifice must be made. So for every car we choose to save, we're going to pick a car that's currently on sale that we think should replace it on the list. So it's kind of like the Soul Stone situation in Avengers where, you know, in order to get what you want, you got to sacrifice something you love. So, all right. So you guys want to get into this? Absolutely. Let's yeah, go. Let's do it. All right. So let's start going through the list. I'm going to start with uh, the number one on our list which is the Alfa Romeo 4C Coupe. That one's pretty sad. Um, I don't think anyone wishes it would go. But the It's pretty mediocre as far as it what it is. Well, uh, the camera, the 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 open top version is staying for yeah. a year. Yeah. yeah. So, it's not gone entirely, so we exactly. don't have to we don't have to cry. Uh, second one is Cadillac ATS sedan, and of course this is being replaced by the CT4. Um, so I don't know if we can call it like it's being killed, yes, but it's being replaced by something um, that is similar. I think it'll be a little larger, but, um, next one, the Chevy city express. So this is a commercial vehicle, basically Chevy's panel van. That is really a Nissan, uh, panel van and Chevy just takes them and puts a Chevy badge on the front. Uh, next one is the Chevy cruise, uh, which is their compact car. Um, next one, Chevy Equinox diesel, um, so this is just the diesel version of Equinox. Equinox is, is staying in general, but um, the version with the diesel engine, which I think was only around for a year or two. I'd is, love to know how many of those they sold. It has to be ridiculously small. Yeah, it's going to be a rare gem on the used market for sure. Uh, the next one going away is the Chevy Volt, um, which, you know, was a very significant vehicle when it launched. It had two generations. Um, and I would argue is always a, a really good idea um, that was executed pretty well. It had some good years, but lately it has fallen on hard times with all the battery electric vehicles that are going on sale now. So um, another great used market pickup, though, because their resale value is really low. Um Next is the Ford C-Max Hybrid and the C-Max uh, Energy, which is the plug-in hybrid version. This one I'm less sad to see go than the similar um, Chevy Volt. Definitely. Uh, never really found fans. Uh, next up is the Ford Fiesta, which is you know the beginning of Ford's axing of all of their cars. Um, and it goes along with the Ford Focus as well as on this list. So both, small, uh, both of Ford's uh, smallest cars uh, are on the axe list. Uh, as well as their sedan, the Ford Fusion. Uh, but the only Fusion going away for 2019 is the Fusion Sport. But the Fusion itself will still be around for at least another year, I think. Yeah, I think kind that's of the as case. a dead car walking. I mean, right. we, it, it's going to go. It's just it kind of gets a brief reprieve. But yeah, that's the way we understand it. Exactly. And the last car on Ford's um, slate of vehicles is the Taurus. And that's, of course, a storied nameplate. But its last year will be 2019. 
still in the Ford camp, uh, we move on to Lincoln with the MKT, the really weird long three row wagon thing that is the the brother to the Ford Flex, even though the Ford Flex is not dying this year, but I, I can't imagine it'll be around for much longer either. Um, Lincoln is also getting rid of the MKX, although that's really the death of a name, uh, because it's being replaced by the Nautilus. So it's more, more just the death of a, of an alpha alphanumeric name. Um, also dying Mercedes AMG SL 63. Definitely sad to see, uh, that go. That's just the range topper, you know, the regular SL, it doesn't have a lot of time left, but it, you can still get a V8 SL. Right. So they're kind of just killing off the trims one by one yeah um next up the nissan 370z roadster the the ancient 370z lives on in coupe form but they're killing the soft top um also the nissan juke the funny looking little subcompact crossover um the smart 4.2 uh, that experiment in the u.s has ended after two generations tesla is even killing a vehicle um actually it's more more a trim the uh, long range rear wheel drive version of the Tesla model three, the longest range Tesla model three, you could get, uh, it could go up to 325 miles on a charge, which is a little bit longer, uh, a little bit farther than the all wheel drive, uh, long range model three can do. Um, also leaving us is the Toyota Corolla IM, which is a, a four door hatchback. And next up, the Toyota Yaris IA, uh, that, which is a very unsung little car. Um, it, it's built on Mazda underpinnings and is a really great handling and really affordable um, kind of subcompact uh, sedan. Uh, definitely should be good on the used market. I would buy my kid that in a heartbeat if I had a kid, which I don't. Um, next up is an, uh, an iconic one, Volkswagen Beetle. Um, this is the, um, second generation of the modern beetle. Um, and this is where, uh, that run ends. And really this is where the, the run of the entire beetle production going back a very long time ends because the beetle won't be produced anywhere else. Uh, like it was kind of, um, the, the old original beetle was produced in some South American countries for a really long time, but, but that's it for the beetle. Also in the U S at least the Volkswagen golf, um, you know, this hasn't been confirmed officially, but we do have it on good word uh, that the five door Golf uh, will not stick around. Um, the GTI and the, and the Golf R will for the next generation, but it seems crazy that we're not getting this car that is like a perennial bestseller in Europe. And actually, we just found out today we will not get a Golf R for next year. So we'll um, have to wait until the eighth generation car to correct. get the Golf R back. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, also, this is kind of surprising just because it's an SUV, the Volkswagen Touring will be leaving us. You know, Volkswagen has the Atlas now, which is kind of doing the duty. And the Touring was always kind of a premium offering. So I think that's probably why it never had huge sales is because it was just so expensive. Also on the list, and these actually aren't even in our article yet. We're going to be updating the article before this podcast goes live. But um, you mentioned the Golf R. There's also uh, the TT. Um, and is it, is it a version of the TT or the TT as a whole? So TT in its current state. So I think they're going to kill the gas powered TT and supposedly bring it back as an EV or something in a few years. Um, but the, but the way we know it now is pretty much dead. Right. So this generation is going to die. It'll probably be in limbo and then we'll see what they come back with. Um, and also just announced, uh, was, uh, the diesel version of the Nissan Titan, um, so Nissan's big truck, they're going to stop selling a diesel version of it, which I think is not a good sign for the Titan, because if you're taking on the domestic uh, full-size truck makers, you want to have as many variants as possible. You want to have as many options. And and taking powertrains off the table is not generally considered um, <laughs> the There's the a rumor that go. we've reported on that it might get a V6, not a V6 diesel, just a, you know, a, a gas powered v6 at the bottom of the range um we it's a very sketchy rumor i'll admit but so it, the diesel is going but there might be some sort of engine to replace it it's not entirely I could, clear yet 
I can see that as a smart move because it would probably bring the base price down. And I yeah. think the only way Toyota and Nissan can compete with the domestics is on price. If they can offer cheaper trucks, then they can get a few sales. But I think Nissan is finding out when you start pricing your truck on the same level as as the Ford, the GM trucks, and, and the Rams, they just can't compete uh, on features and on, on capability and, and stuff like that. So... And uh, one more model to add, uh, the Audi A3 Cabriolet. Um, I am actually working on the story right now. Uh, Car and Driver has announced it. Uh, we have a. I've reached out to Audi just for to double check and confirm that, but it looks like the drop top A3 is going away. Can I be honest? I've never seen a drop top A3 on the road. I don't think I have either. I forgot they even existed. Yeah. So I guess we won't miss that one. Um, all right. So now that we've got the spread before us of all the cars that are being killed this year, um, we have already taken the time before the podcast to make our list of which vehicles on this list that we would choose to save uh, from the crusher. Now, for every vehicle we choose to save, though, we got to throw another vehicle under the bus. So we're going to go around the room and do these kind of one at a time, save one and kill one. Um, Chris, let's start with you. What's the first car you're going to save and what are you going to sacrifice for it? So I think Ford, uh, also you'll notice for my first couple picks, there's kind of a theme going on. I'll just tease that now. Um, I think Ford should keep the Fiesta around. And in order to keep it around, I think the mini hard top three door, or as most people call it, the mini Cooper, I think it needs to go. Really? Um, now but that's, that, like the, that's like the iconic Cooper. Well, okay, first off, I own a 2006 Mini Cooper, and I have since October 31st, 2005, I took delivery of it. I've It's still in the garage. I love my car. But now that BMW is moving more and more to having a front-wheel drive architecture for their lowest, for the, kind of their entry-level models, kind of the way Mercedes-Benz has been moving, I kind of think it makes the Mini brand superfluous. Oh, I, you, so you're 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 not really killing uh, the just the Cooper. You're killing. You, I, you, you I, I would mean, almost in a like greater a sense. I could see the argument for killing the mini brand, but that well, that's a conversation for another day. I think just the base three door, especially with the new one series going front wheel drive. I don't think that there's an argument for it. I think it could go, especially since the Fiesta is such a nice little hatchback. It's been updated for Europe already. There's already, you know, it, it's a nice looking car. And arguably the one in Europe is even nicer looking than the current one. So I think it should stick around. But uh, Jeff? Well, my first one is the Alfa Romeo 4C, which I know it's it's staying around as a convertible, but I love that car. It's really? Just, it's super underrated. I think that is one of the most underrated sports cars right now you know what i would do i would i would keep the coupe and ditch the convertible i would just do it backwards like i'm not a convertible fan so like yeah. I don't, well i don't know why would you ever keep the the drop top version of a car and kill yeah the coupe. i don't i don't understand that either and it's definitely the worst of the two especially since that car is so loud i mean having the top down doesn't really help but i decided if i'm gonna keep the 4c i have to kill something off in that segment or that's relatively you know competitive so I'm going to go with the BMW i8 because why does that car exist? I'm yeah, I, I'm actually a fan of the i8. Like I can say when I've driven it, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, however, like convincing myself, like is there a situation uh, where I win the lottery and I pay someone money for a BMW i8? I can't imagine it. Uh, but if somebody hands me one, uh, I, I actually do enjoy it. Uh, but man, is that the hardest car to get in and out of? It is, a it huge, is. so hard. It's just um, like that when it came out, it was super futuristic looking. I mean, it's still futuristic looking, but it, it was more revolutionary when it came out. And now we're kind of just letting it slowly just linger without, I mean, they introduced the Roadster, which is kind of cool. But other than I've that, I've never it, seen one of those on the road either. But. Yeah, it's just, it's just. The oh I man, in Miami they're like they're like rats. Oh yeah, uh, I see the I eight all the time. Then. Oh yeah, they're all over Miami. Yeah, so I I has got to go, and the four C. Everyone needs to go buy a four C. That's my advice. Honestly, I've never driven one, and now you guys are giving me two completely opposite uh, takes on it. So though I guess I I should be completely honest. I've driven the four C four times, and I have never had one that wasn't broken 
to some extent. So <laughs> I believe that. Well, here's uh, the thing. I think the 4C, because they started in like the 70s, right? They are expensive for how small. Th- they're not. A ch- yeah. But, no, but it's like a Lotus. Like Lotuses are like that, too, where they're right, just but, insanely expensive. But that was my argument is that if you look at them on the used market, they're depreciating pretty quickly. And for, you know, one, I think they're kind of still hovering in like the 40s ish, even high 40s now. But once they drop, you know, if it's a, if it, you could buy one for 28, that's a whole different thing. Um, that could be a fun car for that kind of price. Um, you know, before we get to mine, I want to go back to yours, Chris, for a second. And I do echo that. I really like the Fiesta. I actually almost bought a five door, uh, Fiesta hatchback titanium, which was like, you know, the high, the high end, the highest trim level. Um, and it's just a really fun car to drive. And it came with, it was like under $20,000 new, which was, this was back in 2014. Uh, with mini though, I really want to see mini come out with a production version version of the rocket man concept which is like a sub mini a sub three-door mini uh, car like it kind of goes back to the roots of mini with a really small car like a smart four two sized car um i would love to see that because all you know just with with mini's uh return in the modern era they have just kept getting bigger and heavier and 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 i just want to see that return to its roots before before the brand goes away i don't think the brand's going away but um, and, it, and they're expensive too i mean the countryman are. is countryman is kind of cool but for what you're paying for that you might as well just get a bmw at that point true true although i like the clubman the clubman's my jam and bmw doesn't really make a similar car to that but all right let me get into let me get into my first one um speaking of the 42 I'm going to pick the 4-2. I feel like you guys are are snickering at me, maybe, for picking this car. It's My kind- brow is furrowed, that's for all, sure. All right, all right, I'll take that. That's a nice way of putting it. I love weird cars, and I love I love when automakers try to make business models out of them, and, and certainly uh, uh, Daimler tried to with Smart in the U.S. Obviously, they sell a bunch of these in Europe and other places, and in the U.S., it's always been hampered by the fact that Gas prices are cheap, SUVs are popular, but man, this is a rear-engined, rear-wheel drive, impossibly small car. Um, it did improve with the second generation, and the electric version, which is actually all they're selling at the moment in the U.S., is not that bad. It's like pretty fun to drive. It's not a huge range. It's under 100 miles still, but I don't know. I just feel like I wanted to see it keep going. I wanted to see what it would do next, and I, I, I think the U.S. market is better for it to have something at this very, very small end, this really kind of like urban vehicle. Um, and I actually do see, to this day, 4 twos everywhere. Um, honestly, not as many of the second generations as the first generations. I think there was like a popularity when it first came out um, that kind of died off. But I don't know. I, I, I think we were better off for having it, and I'm a little sad to see it go. Something has to be sacrificed. I am going to sacrifice. In order to bring the 4-2 back, I would sacrifice the Nissan Maxima. This is a vehicle that for ages has had no point because the Nissan Altima, which sells about five to ten times more um, units than the Maxima does, is actually bigger than the Maxima. I mean, it was originally that the Altima was like uh, the compact car and the Maxima was like the midsize. Well, the Sentra was the compact and then... Altima and then that okay yeah I'll give Maxima. okay you're right so it was Centra Altima Maxima and they but they were clearly delineated in size oh, back definitely. in the day but then for whatever reason Nissan put the Altima on a growth spurt and the Altima I believe is technically um, rated as a full size car by the EPA according to passenger volume and its passenger volume is bigger than that of the Maxima it's actually uh, a little longer lengthwise than the Maxima yeah it's cr- it's it's crazy and also like. The Maxima, it's it's oddly styled. I don't know. Maybe you guys like the styling, but I would see. I love the styling of the Maxima personally. I, well, but what, what I would see you where you're would coming you, from. Would, if you were Nissan, would you keep the Altima, which sells you know twenty five thousand units, and and get rid of the Maxima, or would you keep the Maxima and try to make the Maxima your 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 you know, big sedan. I, I just think the, the Altima already has the foothold in the sales. Right. I, th- so I think that's the, the argument. Altima. I think the Maxima ship has kind of sailed. It was a fantastic, you know, it had the whole four door sports car branding back in the day, but just now, the last it, several generations have kind of 
languished a lot. And I, yeah, I agree that maybe kill the Maxima and let the Ultima bloom. Yeah, I mean, it's competing and with like the Impala and the Avalon and like, I mean, these are not high volume segments. Um, and yeah, they're like I said, they're just when you're when your supposed midsize car is bigger than your full size car, then, you know, one of them doesn't need to be built anymore. Um, all right. Swing back around to you, Chris. What's your next one? This is more of a naming thing. I prefer the ATS name to the CT4, and I would keep ATS around over CT4. This, So maybe it's not so much keeping the vehicle around as keeping the name around, but to me, the ATS, CTS, XTS, or however you want to do it, naming convention, I prefer it over CT4, CT5, etc. So I would keep ATS around, personally. I- I, you know, in my opinion, I think both naming conventions are terrible because they're both alphanumeric names. They're you know, just call a car, give a car a name. I, I mean, in essence, I agree with that, but I know the argument always goes to when you sell them in foreign markets, the name doesn't mean anything, and blah blah blah. But maybe I just got used to CTS, that's you know, STS, blah blah blah, for so long that I'm just used to that. But I like the ATS name. I actually like the vehicle. I the coupe especially is a fairly attractive car in my opinion. Um, but uh, going back to what I would kill, and this goes back to the theme of I can't stand retro styled cars anymore. I think the the that trend had its day when it was the Mini and the Mustang and the new Beetle and stuff like that. But now it just drives me up the wall. So I think the Fiat 500 has to die. There are problems with it. I wish they would have developed it more. Yeah, um, that's the problem with it is that it's too old and it's not competitive. What competes directly with a with a tiny three-door Fiat 500 these days? Uh, I mean, we used to say the Smart 4-2 did. Uh, but that's certainly not the case anymore. Uh, honestly, I think this, again, this is, this is kind of the same pit that the other small car brands have fallen into where we're just in an age of cheap fuel, cheap financing. So SUVs are flying out the door and anything small, anything fuel efficient is, has a hard time of, you know, generating interest. I, I think the fact that the Fiat 500 was, kind of a retro uh thing and it did have really I, i'm gonna say cute styling but what i really mean is that it at least ha- you know it at least created a reaction in people like a, an emotional reaction like there are, there are tons of versions of the fiat 500 i love i love the 500c that's a great way they do the convertible top where it slides down in the back but there's still like the frame i love the abarth you know the retro thing is done but i guess hmm. my issue is that when you go with retro styling is that it and when you try to update retro styling, it ages incredibly quickly because people look at it and it looks kind of old immediately. And you, and in my opinion, you have to kind of be ready to iterate on it quickly. All right, um, remember that thought because when we come back around to me, I'm gonna one of my picks is gonna be the exception to that rule. Okay, I can't wait to see it. All right, uh, let's move on to your second one, Jeff. So I'm gonna sh- I'm gonna save the Chevy Equinox diesel. I know the Equinox still exists as the gas-powered version, but, I, I mean, that's whatever. I, something about the diesel, when you, when I drove the diesel, it just felt so satisfying. I mean, there was a lot of torque, it was super efficient, and the Equinox, you know, is still a pretty good SUV. So I think the addition of that diesel, that diesel engine really helped that car. I think, though, in order to kill... Or in order to keep the the diesel alive, you sort of need to need to kill something similar in that segment again, like my first pick. So I'm gonna pick the Jeep Compass because I don't really know why that even is a thing. I would have argued before they had redone the Jeep Compass, you could throw it out the door and nobody would care. Right. But the redesigned version, I think, is a pretty decent subcompact. SUV. Well, is it a subcompact? Because well, they that's have the, the thing. So that's the problem. You have it gets the really renegade. crowded. You have the Jeep's Renegade lineup. and you have the Cherokee. And the Cherokee's right. not huge. And the Compass isn't much smaller than that. I think they're they're kind of overlapping too much between the Compass and the Cherokee. And I don't think there are enough redeeming qualities of the Compass to sort of warrant not buying a Cherokee. So that doesn't that SUV doesn't really make sense to me. And, you know, by this game's rules, if I have to keep something I love to... Uh, 
If I have to get rid of something to keep something I love, the compass has got to go. Yeah, you know what? I, I think you're right because the the when they brought out the compass, they also redesigned the front end of the Cherokee above it so that their front ends look identical like they almost have the the exact like they they even look similar when you see them on the road now which is a shame i i even though i mean do you guys remember when the spy shots came out of the redesigned cherokee and people were like that's the ugliest thing ever and that that design that that uh of the cherokee and i want to call it first gen but like you know the first uh generation of the new cherokee I, that grew, grew on me so much over the years, and I thought it looked great, especially when it was butched up in the uh, Trailhawk edition and all that. So I, I actually don't like that they made the front end of the Cherokee more normal, but by doing so, they made it look just like the Compass, and now those two vehicles just kind of fight with each other. And the Renegade actually has its own cool little styling edge going on. So I would pick, yeah, you're right, I would I would keep that instead of, instead of the Compass. So. Yeah, I think the Compass would be more forgivable if it looked different i mean like you said the compass and the cherokee they look the same now so i don't really see the point of having both yeah and with the diesel with the equinox diesel i completely agree with what you said about it i whenever i drive uh you know of course i've driven diesel trucks before and that's a whole other thing uh but when i'm driving like a passenger car with a diesel engine there's just the driving experience is so nice because it just feels like there's wells of power. Not that the power comes on like fast and and hard, like a, you know, like a sports car or something. It's just, you dip into the accelerator and it just, it just says, okay, I'll do it. I'm going to get there. And, 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 and it's just like a quiet, unrushed well of power. And then you look down and you're like 50 miles per gallon average. You're like, what the hell? It's such a cool driving experience. So I'm a little sad that that diesel passenger cars are really, really being punished for the diesel gate and all of the law breaking that went on with that, Um, especially because GM didn't do any of that law breaking. So but they're definitely suffering because of it. All right. So I guess I'm up next. Um, uh, So what I want to save is, uh, I think, a pretty obvious one. Um, the Volkswagen Beetle. Um, I don't want to see this storied nameplate end. And as a matter of fact, I think it's, I think it's actually at a high watermark. When they brought the new Beetle back, you know, that was dripping in kind of retroism. That was that leaned into it, right, into the the cutesy nature of the of the Beetle. When they redesigned it for the second time, I I thought one one interesting thing that the designers did that I I heard them talk about was they didn't redesign the new Beetle. They designed another Beetle based off the original. So it wasn't that they were creating the second generation of the new Beetle. It was that they were doing a second attempt, an altogether different attempt at redesigning the original Beetle. And I think the second generation one is an amazing design. Um, I'm, I've, I, and I think they did some fun stuff with it with good special editions. Um, the Dune was pretty cool, although it would have been fun if they had done some more mechanical stuff to it. I wish that thing had been all wheel drive. That's oh. the one thing. You know, if they had used, you know, the Volkswagen's two liter turbo with all wheel drive in that car, it would have been so much more amazing than it was. Yeah. I just I wish they had just leaned into it more, like even even a, a couple more inches of ground clearance, larger yeah. wheels and tires. Even uh, that. Yeah. All that stuff. Um, maybe spare spare, uh, spare wheel, uh, spare tire on the back, you know, something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, and this is I mean, this is one of the most famous iconic cars of all time so to, yeah to see it end its run and kind of in a whimper um is is not I, I don't like seeing it um however what i would choose to sacrifice i would be happy to um take a baseball bat too and i'm gonna cheat a little i'm gonna pick three cars because i'm not just killing a car i'm killing a kind of car uh i'm picking the honda clarity fuel cell the Hyundai Tucson fuel cell and the Toyota Mirai. Uh, I think fuel hydrogen fuel cell cars are dumb. I, you guys remember the movie mean girls, uh, when that girl was trying to make the word fetch happen, it's not happening. Hydrogen cars are not happening. So these companies should just stop. Um, the train has already left the station for, uh, full on electric vehicles. Um, charging infrastructure is already being built for that. 
Uh, in addition to, you know, the actual electric grid that everyone has pumped into their house to recharge electric vehicles, you know, I could count the number of uh, hydrogen refueling stations outside of California on one hand, probably. Um, they're just not going to happen. Nobody cares. Um, you know, I, I feel like they don't even really sell these um, to the general public. It's like they always come with conditions of like, you got to live near a hydrogen fueling station and you can only lease it and you got to give it back. And whatever these guys can uh, it's just it's not happening uh and i don't even want to see it happen like i would rather the development of battery electric vehicles continue because you know if we can switch the grid over to cleaner sources of energy like renewables uh that's much better we don't have to go um you know bottling hydrogen up oh god i have so many things to say uh (laughs) has the beetle ever been a good car the second gen beetle or any beetle ever Oh, like God, a yes. good car. <laughs> yes, come on. Really? I mean, it was the the original Beetle was a cheap car. It was an affordable car. But that's what makes car? it good. I mean, it all depends on how you define good. Well, but. yeah, that's true. But I mean, the current Beetle even is, I don't know. Why would I ever buy that over anything else outside of styling? Like, it's not good. But that's, that's a big reason. Like, if you, again, all car purchases, I think, have a huge emotional element to them. Right. And the Beetle has always kind of had an edge in that respect where people just fall in love with it but then you get in it and you drive it and you realize that you bought it just because of styling because nothing else is redeemable and i know i'm being I, harsh I, I on the that's beetle too, that's way too harsh i wouldn't say that they're not it's, redeemable i would say that's it's it, i would say you'd get in a beetle and you would realize oh this is a pretty normal car except for how it looks yeah okay all right fair i mean the beetle just i mean to 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 Chris's point on retro styling, that's another one of those cars that's like, you got to let it die. You got to do something different because retro styling to me just doesn't work at all anymore. Yeah, I, I I could see a Beetle coming back under Volkswagen's ID electric range. Yes. Maybe not, you know, may, yeah, maybe a retro futuristic Beetle, um, you know, so, you know keep the hatchback keep kind of that stuff you could actually since it's electric you could do rear engine rear wheel drive pretty easily like the original um you you know yeah see i don't i don't have this um i don't have the same reaction to you guys uh that you guys do to the retro styling i think it all i think it depends on a case-by-case basis i think some retro styling um leans way too heavily um on that nostalgia factor and i think other ones are just done really well um and can continue and like i said i think volkswagen did the smart thing by not trying to redesign the new beetle they just made a new version of the old beetle again um so i you know i i think if it's done well it can always be gone back to and we talk about we talk about this all the time because a lot of dealerships around the country are making um, retro versions of vehicles because the automakers won't. We're seeing like throwback versions of Chevy trucks and Ford trucks and and companies are making uh, modern versions of the GMC Cyclone. And, you know, there, there's always there, there always seems to be a demand for stuff like that. And then it those just depends on retro execution. And, uh, sorry. Um, those aren't retro in quite the same way, though. I almost think of those as the way sneaker companies do colorways in retro ways, where they're taking the modern truck but applying the old color schemes and touches onto them. Like, um, I know the one G people, or I think it's the Gladiator people are putting, or a dealer's putting um, uh, wood panel decals essentially on the side to make it look like, you know, some of the older Jeeps, or uh, the, the one Ford with the blue and white that the dealers doing those are thoroughly modern vehicles that look totally modern they just have a retro color scheme yeah but don't you think that's pulling the same nostalgic string and the only reason the dealers are doing it that way is because that's all they're capable of doing like a dealer's not a dealer can't redesign a vehicle or launch a vehicle all they can do is add to vehicles to add those nostalgic elements but i think they're doing that and there's a market for it because it's pulling on that same nostalgic string of people remember vehicles when they were younger. And, you know, when you remind them of that, it, it again, makes an emotional attachment to a vehicle, gets them to want to buy it. You know what I will say though, John, I mean, to all the retro, you know, modern trucks and SUVs that you mentioned are exactly that. There are no cars that manufacture or that dealerships are doing that to. I mean, I'm sure there's a few, but 
I think the the retro car design thing has worn out, and I think retro trucks and SUVs are starting to sort of make a comeback. Because even if you look at like the Telluride or the Rivian, like those are very boxy, like old school kind of designs, and I think that is going to be more popular coming up. And even Volkswagen with the bus, that's going to be. Yeah, I think it's going to be a hit. Yeah, I think you're right. That's a really good observation. You're right. It seems like all of the current wave of nostalgia is kind of being applied to trucks more than cars. Um, any any disagreements with uh, me uh, killing all f- hydrogen fuel cell vehicles? Yes. I I am a very pro-hydrogen fuel cell person. and I, Interesting. Do tell. I don't really know why. I think... <laughs> <laughs> good way to start. You know, I think what it is is the convenience factor. Because there is no convenience factor. Well, there is theoretically, right? So, so if you have a hydrogen fuel cell station on every corner, like you do a gas station, why would you not buy hydrogen fuel cell, right? The problem because, is, well, oh, sure, but that's not true, and it would take an act of God to, to get us there, or thirty years and like a trillion dollars. Would it though? I mean, how much? I mean, I understand that the technology for hydrogen fuel cell is crazy complex and I'm not even going to pretend to know what I'm talking about but someone with money and who's smart can figure it out right I mean if Elon Musk can do all this stuff with uh, you know Tesla and all the charging infrastructure someone could theoretically do the same thing with fuel cells right I mean I guess but there's got to be a reason nobody is and, and I would say the reason is because the the promise and potential of battery powered cars is more i mean the, there are there are right now uh tesla superchargers that can add 75 miles of range in five minutes there are there are chargers that can are, are charging at the rate of like a thousand mile uh, adding a thousand miles in an hour so the charge rates are going up uh quickly a, as well Um, so, and uh, like I said, it's way easier to build out an EV charging infrastructure than a hydrogen refueling infrastructure. So I I, I guess what I'm saying is I, sure it, that what you're saying might be true if there were a hydrogen refueling station on every corner, but the logistics of that happening are the the challenges are so great. I don't think it's ever going to happen. Well, you know what it is. It's, it's the gas companies and I'm not going to get all political here, but Theoretically, if the gas companies were like, you know what, we're going to stop digging for oil and we're going to invest all in fuel cell technology. Every shell is going to be a fuel cell station. They could do it. I mean. But still, every house is going to have an electrical outlet. Right. Yeah. But yeah, charging over an electrical outlet still takes, you know, eight to 10 hours if you have a good one. I think the convenience factor is what sells me on hydrogen fuel cell over I don't know, EVs man. right I- now. I- you guys know my wife just got a Tesla Model 3. We got a 240 volt outlet put in our garage. She charges it maybe once a week because it has a 315 mile range. Um, I mean, there's just there's no downside to it at all right. in terms of inconvenience. There's no inconvenience to it all. It's actually very convenient. Well, I'm not um, I'm not down on EVs either. I think it's great, and I think I would love to buy one. But for me, so I just drove to Orlando uh, last week. And theoretically, if I were to buy a Model 3, right, the range of the Model 3 is, the, even the long range one is what, 320, 330? I would uh, have. Yeah, well, no, well, 315 actually, but let's say, yeah, 300 plus. So I would have to stop around halfway and recharge, which would, without a fast charger, would take like half an hour, right? And then I'd have to map well, out. Would you, would you be stopping at a Tesla supercharger? Well, that depends. I'd have to find one on the way there, and I don't right. think they're... I mean, I mean, I don't know. They're pretty strategically placed for yeah. long-range travel, but yeah, you'd have to look. Yeah. It's just the, the convenience I still don't think is totally there. I mean, it's on the, well, it's coming, but... Look at it this way. If you were driving a fuel cell vehicle, you could only probably travel uh, the, only the radius away from your house that you could get back because there isn't a hydrogen fueling station anywhere you know that you're going to find out there. Yeah, it's the same point I was going to make. Um, also, let, let me let me uh, maybe say another reason why fuel cells uh, haven't caught on and should die. Let's look at these cars and you tell me uh, what level of excitement or passion they instill in you. The Honda Clarity, the Hyundai Tucson, the Toyota Mirai. These are the biggest snooze fest vehicles that one could build a new technology on. And I think 
whatever you think about uh, Tesla, one thing they got right was they made exciting vehicles. They started with, you know, the Roadster. Um, and even though you might not think a full size sedan or, you know, like a mid size sedan, like a Model 3 is exciting on the face of it, they made sure that they were the fastest cars around and that makes them exciting. But none of these none of the fuel cell vehicles that have ever been sold have instilled any passion or excitement in anybody, which, you know, helps push the technology along if people are interested in the vehicle itself. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the Nexo is kind of cool, um, but... Oh, I forgot about the Nexo. Yeah, because they um, don't sell any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's kind of proving my point. But even the isn't the Nexo just based on... Um, Kona, yeah, it's the Kona. So it's just the Kona. Yeah. Um, so, all right, let, let's uh, let's keep the train moving. I think this is our last uh, go around the table. Um, Chris, what's your last save? What's your last kill? So it's actually really interesting we started this conversation because this is going to piggyback nicely on top of it. Um, so the first part, I'm going to keep the Volkswagen Touareg because to me it is far more attractive than the Atlas or the Tiguan. I kind of... From a Volkswagen business perspective, I understand because they have so many other crossovers in that kind of luxury space from Audi or Porsche, or if you really go up in price Bentley, that the I can understand why you would ask the Touareg, but from an aesthetic perspective, I think it's way better looking than the vehicles that are replacing it's, it. It's very handsome. And there have been some really cool engines for the Touareg throughout mm -hmm. uh, its lifespan. Uh, it had a diesel right V10 diesel a yeah. V10 diesel oh yeah. man that would be such a great used car get um but to piggyback on what we were talking about in order to keep the Touareg I would kill the Toyota Prius Ooh, and it here is why I think the time for a vehicle that's dedicated on a hybrid powertrain is over I think we are to the point where a hybrid is not novel anymore, and you can put a hybrid powertrain in any vehicle you want, and it's fine, and it's no longer special, and at that point, you no longer need the Prius. You can make a Camry hybrid, and no one's going to well, bat an eye at I think, it. I think Toyota agrees with you because they just launched the Corolla hybrid, which basically sure. is... Which is the like, same tech as the Prius. Same yes. tech as the Prius and like one mile per gallon, you know, uh, fewer, which is like nothing in the grand scheme of things. So uh, I agree with you. Like being a hybrid isn't anything special. And I don't think the, the Prius has as, as large a lead over other cars in terms of fuel economy that it once had. All, but here here's where Toyota screwed up. They, they were king of the hybrid hill with the Prius. Right. Like the Prius outsold everything. Especially the second gen. The first gen kind of proved that the tech worked and then the second gen was like, that's the one that like Leonardo DiCaprio was buying and stuff like that. Right, right, exactly. Um, but what they didn't do was take the next step and start immediately, you know, uh, planning long term for electric vehicles. As a matter of fact, they uh, Toyota could be you can find quotes of them saying that electric vehicles aren't going to happen. And they were putting all their chips on fuel cells. Um, which is why we have the, the Mirai. Um, and only recently have they, um, they haven't admitted their mistake, but they've changed their plans and have announced, you know, their future plans for like, you know, a full electric lineup, like every other company is, is announcing. So they made a major misstep and I think it kind of left the Prius, uh, out, um, high and dry because that could have transitioned nicely into a full battery powered lineup and, and, and the Prius could have kept growing as a brand, but instead it kind of just kept getting, you know, I, I mean, look, it, it stayed the most, um, fuel efficient vehicle in the U S for a very long time. Oh, and sure. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the Prius as a vehicle. I just think the time has come yeah, where I agree. you don't need a dedicated hybrid vehicle. You can just put that powertrain in a CR or not a CRV, I'm sorry, a RAV4 or a Camry or a Corolla and it's fine and you don't need to sell people on, oh, this is a Prius. Yeah, I think the only shame is that I think they at one point in time had so, so much like brand equity in oh, Prius yep. and I think a lot of it has been kind of wasted away um, because they didn't kind of capitalize on it and make the right uh, business decisions to, to carry that through uh, to batteries or something like that. Um, all right, Jeff, what's your last pick? Uh, I'm going to echo Chris and say, or Chris's earlier pick, and say that the F Ford Fiesta needs to stick around. Uh, wow, th I, this is the only um, 
uh, one that's gotten two votes so far. Yeah, so I thought about the Focus, and the new Focus for Europe is super nice. Um, but it kind of doesn't make sense because the Echo Sport, people are going to buy that like 10 times over the Focus, even though it's... I don't know that sales actually bear that out, but okay. <laughs> That's true. But theoretically, right, people want subcompact SUVs over hatchbacks. Um, but I think the Fiesta is still small enough to make sense, right? You don't have a, you don't have a, a an SUV that small. I mean, there's it's still a jump from the from the Fiesta to the Echo Sport. So I think the Fiesta would still make sense. Um, but in order to do that, I think you would need to kill off one of its competitors, which would be the Honda Fit. Whoa. Whoa. I agree with ha- your half rate. Let's keep the Fiesta, but let's keep the Fit, too. I mean, the, but, fit, the fit has generally been considered, like, the standard for, um, I mean, what size class? Subcompact hatchbacks? Yeah. Um, you know, with this, little ma- with this little magic rear seat that flips up, and, and uh, it's very versatile. Uh, wow, that's bold. That's bold. Yeah, but that car has flown under the radar for too long. Like, when are they going to totally redo it it's just been sitting forever i mean it feels like it i don't know when the last actual like full makeover or full update was well it's a very it's a very global vehicle they sell it all over the world i think it's called the jazz and other markets Mm. um and so you know it's definitely not going away altogether because it's it's a huge probably a sales juggernaut globally um also, know, can man. we take a can we take a moment to say that there should be a Fit Si to compete against the Fiesta uh, ST? Yeah, definitely. That would be good. <laughs> that would be awesome. I mean, honestly, I thought that's why you guys wanted to bring the Fiesta back was to get the Fiesta ST back. Uh, well, but yeah, neither of that, you mentioned it. That is a big part of it because the Fiesta ST was very good. I mean, it's still you can get those for used for really cheap, and they're awesome cars. Um, but just the Fiesta as a whole makes sense. If you want something that's affordable and easy to live with and you don't want a crossover necessarily, I think the Fiesta is just a good car. I, you know, I guess the reason I'm surprised is because um, the Fit, I think, is more versatile than the Fiesta. Like, it, it, it's an equally small car, but the interior is much larger and can be configured in more ways. Like it's like when you get that small of a car, you need something that can, um, do a lot of things well. And the fits very good at that. Or I think the Fiesta is a little bit more hampered by its, its packaging and things like that. Um, I can tell you the current fit appears to have been around since 2013. So yeah, it's long in the tooth for sure. For sure. Hmm. All right, that, uh, a controversial pick, uh, but we'll let it stand. Um, let me uh, let me throw out my last one. Uh, what I would like to see continued to be built, my last choice, is the Chevy Cruze. Um, and this is uh, less because I think it's a great product, although I think it was a fine product. But uh, and Chris, maybe you uh, feel this way too. Um, Chris and I both live in Ohio. I live not that far away from uh, the Lordstown plant where it's built. And I just have to say, like, look, whoever you are listening to this podcast, I don't know where you live. But if you live within the vicinity of an automotive plant, like you, you just it's not that you feel the the reverberations when a plant closes. But like what you know, I mean. I, I live in Cleveland and the local news talks about Lordstown all the time. I mean, these are a lot of people that are losing their jobs. They, they built a good car, they built it well. And, and then this thing is suddenly happening to them. So, you know, I, I love, I actually loved the first gen cruise. I thought that was actually better than the second gen. There was a, um, speaking of like Prius competitors, there was a, uh, uh, like a, high fuel efficiency version of the first generation cruise and it was gas powered it was not diesel uh but it was just like it had some aerodynamic tweaks it had a super efficient um engine and a transmit and it was like it was the best version of the cruise they ever made it was so smooth um really nice power and got crazy good fuel mileage for a gas powered vehicle when they did the redesign i don't know it just it felt like more of the same i guess it didn't feel like it really um, improved in any significant way. And then they had the, the cruise hatchback, which was 
not a it, it was neither a good hatchback nor a good business decision um it really i mean the back the back hatch was so raked that it hardly had any extra cargo capacity compared to the sedan um and then they also had the cruise diesel which you know like we were talking about diesel passenger cars before you know i thought uh, you know, I, I, I think it was it was victim of of the diesel gate and some of that and and the rise in, in popularity of hybrids. But but ultimately, there's this great plant sitting over in Lordstown that made uh, uh, great cars for a really long time. And now they're holding out hope that this company called Workhorse that makes electric trucks is going to buy it from GM and put some of these people back to work. But ultimately, I just, you know. Uh, you know, I'm not like a, a nationalist who wants to see, um, you know, American plants making cars at all costs because then we would all be paying ten thousand dollars extra per car. Uh, but this was a really good plant, um, and it, I, it definitely I thought deserved to find a solution somewhere or find a, a really good buyer to take it over. And it's still waiting for that. Um, all right, to put something uh, put something out of its misery that I think should be sacrificed in order to get the cruise back. I'm going to pick the Volkswagen Passat. And the reason I'm picking the Passat, even though I generally think the Passat is good, but Volkswagen also sells the Ardeon, which is like a more expensive, uh, prettier, better handling version of the Passat. I would rather Volkswagen just get rid of the Passat, figure out how to make less expensive versions of the Ardeon, and then just have the Ardeon be its, its midsize slash full-size car. Um, the, the Passat is perhaps one of the most boring looking cars ever made. It is just, you look at it and the only word that pops into your head is car. Like it's, it's also, just, uh, it's also a nonsensical car in its own way, given the fact that the American version and the European version are completely different. And from what our European colleagues tell me, the European one is far and away better. So it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the only thing the American version of the Passat has ever had going for it is it is physically huge. It has perhaps the the greatest amount of interior space and rear legroom. Um, so, you know, whenever anybody would ask me about the Passat and whether it's a good car to buy, that's the only thing I could say about it was it's got a really big backseat. Um, now, if you look at the Ardeon, the Ardeon, oh, that's a gorgeous looking car. It's it's it's. I'm trying to think really quickly off the top of my head. Is there any prettier Volkswagen on sale in the U.S.? And I don't think so. It's it's got to be the Ardeon. So I think they've got it. You know, much like uh, Nissan has the Maxima and the Altima, and one of them can go. I think Volkswagen has the Passat and the Ardeon, and one of them can go. And I would pick the Ardeon to stay. That makes sense. I mean, to your point earlier about the cruise. Uh, a lot like the Equinox, the diesel hatchback was my favorite cruise, and I and it definitely wasn't a good hatchback by you know hatchback standards, but uh, it was a great little car. I mean, that was a fun car to drive. Yeah, I think, like I said, I think you know, I I, I half want to save the cruise because it was a good car, but I also want to half save it because you know the plant is near me and right. and I hear these stories all the time. Uh, but it was definitely a good car. But, you know, I mean, just like Ford, all, all of these small cars are getting axed in favor of small SUVs. And that's, you know, the reality we live in today until the next oil crisis comes or or what. But um, so. So, yeah, I don't I don't think the cruise uh, deserves to go. And I'm happy to sacrifice the Passat to, to keep it around. Uh, if only we had the power to do any of this, which we don't. But <laughs> that's what makes thought experiments so fun. Um, all right. Well, we'd love to hear what all of you have to think about uh, our decisions on what to keep and what to kill. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Motor One Com. And of course, uh, the discussion will continue there. And of course, on our on our website, MotorOne.com, uh, we talk about the stuff in the comments all the time. So join us there. Uh, coming up, we're going to find out what we've been driving this week. Uh, but before the break, I just want to remind everyone, if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, so please hit subscribe so you get the next episode. Welcome back. Uh, during this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today I'm going to start with you, Jeff. What are you driving this week? So I was in Nashville uh, towards the tail end of last week and driving the Nissan Versa, the brand new for 2020 Nissan Versa. 
Ah, so speaking of small cars, this one is uh, happens to still be around. But this is, I mean, this is the car that was the cheapest car in America for a while. I don't think it is anymore, though, right? Yeah, it was. Uh, it's fourteen thousand three hundred seventy dollars now, which is the makes it the second uh, cheapest car in America, just behind the Spark LS. Uh, but I mean, fourteen thousand for what you get is it's kind of ridiculous that you can get. Automatic emergency braking, rear automatic emergency braking, you know, a touchscreen, a digital instrument cluster for fourteen grand on the Versa. Yeah, talk about the talk about the trickle down of technology and particularly safety technology from you know like luxury vehicles and and much more expensive cars. I mean, that is insane that you get that you're going to get active safety systems like automatic emergency braking on a sub fifteen thousand dollar new car. Um, honestly, like if I had. Um, a kid who is just starting to drive or going off to college, like, yeah, I mean, I would be totally attracted to that for, you know, you're getting a warranty for one because it's a new car. You're getting these safety features that you'd pay uh, a lot of extra for a few years ago. Um, and yeah, and it's otherwise, you know, and good infotainment system. So did it did it drive well? It drove fine. I mean, it drives like a Versa. It, it's totally acceptable. I mean, there is nothing super inoffensive about it. I mean, it's kind of slow. I think the the engine it, it's it's the same engine from the from the previous Versa. So there's really no mechanical updating. I think it's a little more powerful and they tweaked it a little bit. So 122 horsepower and 114 pound feet of torque, which is it's totally fine. I mean, I think the only issue that I really had was the CVT was super loud. I mean, even for CVT, just based on how good CVTs have gotten these days, it shouldn't be as loud as it was. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's a totally fine car to toss around. There's nothing offensive about it. I, and between this and the kicks, I can't really find a reason to recommend anything else uh, for like young buyers, like you said, John, because standard safety, automatic emergency braking, um, and rear automatic emergency braking in the Versa. And then, you know, Apple CarPlay, touchscreen, it's just, it's hard to find a car that's better at this, at this price. You know, it's, it's funny because, um, I just finished a book about the Yugo, uh, which of course used to be the cheapest car sold in America in the late eighties at thirty nine ninety five, um, and was basically a death trap and had no features at all. Um, and now we're talking about a car that sure is for, uh, you know, three to four times the price. But, you know, now the, the cheapest car in America comes with all these standard features and infotainment and, and, and to talk about safety, I mean, are legitimately safe cars. Um, man, what a difference in 30 years uh, from the days of Yugo to the days of, of the Versa and the Nissan Note. Yeah. And we just had a Mirage, uh, Mitsubishi Mirage, I don't know, last week, two weeks ago. How is that not the cheapest car in the U.S.? It's not. That's what's crazy because the Mirage is so bad. You get a metal key. You get a, a terrible, you know, all the buttons and knobs are super cheap. Stuff is falling out. Meanwhile, you have the Versa that's, you know, a few thousand cheaper, maybe a few hundred cheaper, like base, base model than the Mirage. And it's really, like, nice. It's really well finished and it looks surprisingly good. I didn't think I was going to like the way it looked in person, but it looks like a shrunken Altima. It's a little stubby because just that class, you can't yeah, really the, avoid and the proportions, it. proportions, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's a good looking car. The Mirage is really the Yugo the Yugo of our time. Yes. How much did you say the Yugo started at when it was new? 39.95. Whoa. So I just out of curiosity, I plugged it in in 1989, January 1989, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 39.95 today is $8,449. Yeah, so, so imagine imagine how stripped a new car today would have to be to for match eighty five hundred dollars essentially. Yeah. yeah. Hey, they were being built by communists in uh in uh what country was it? Yugoslavia, right? Isn't that why it was? Oh in yeah, Yugo? yeah, Yugoslavia. Zastava? Well, okay. Uh, the the Yugo and Yugoslavia the the Yugo does not come from the name Yugoslavia. Uh, I'll have to look it up. The book talked about it, but people think it's called Yugo because of the name of the country, and it's not. It's actually from something else. But unfortunately, I can't finish the cool anecdote with the actual answer because <laughs> I don't remember. But uh, I'll look it up and maybe bring it to next week's podcast. Um, all right. So, uh, Chris, what have you been driving this past week? 
So uh, last Monday, I got a direct message on our Slack channel from my coworker, Chris Smith, who I'm sure you're also familiar with if you've been reading Motor One. And he asked me if I owned an Xbox One X, and I didn't. And he had just bought an Xbox One X, which is the top of the line. I was looking to move his S, which is kind of the middle grade, and asked me if I wanted it. So a PayPal transaction later, and last Friday, I have a Xbox One. And so I have been playing Forza Horizon 4. Ah, how do you like it? I love it. It's a ton of fun. It's great. Uh, It runs great on that version of the console. Um, My... The car I've mostly been using is the modern Acura NSX with a little bit of a Lancia 037 Stradale mixed Mm. in as well. Um, Okay. It's a super fun game. Now, are you... Okay, because I got... uh, Very recently, I got Xbox Game Pass so I could try out Forza Horizon 4. Yep, I did Uh, the same thing for the dollar month thing. Yeah, yeah, on the recommendation of Chris Smith, as a matter of fact. And I don't know, maybe I'm getting old and I just... Because I haven't been playing a lot of video games lately. I played it... uh, To be honest, I played it once. Uh, I didn't really give it a huge shot. But I, I... I'm the kind of gamer with that kind of game who has to follow like the career. So I go wherever they tell me, like if they say, Oh, this guy wants you to race over there. I go drive and race over there. Are are you doing that? Or are you just doing the open sandbox? I'm going to go drive around wherever the hell I want. A little bit of both. So I've done a lot. So I knew from looking online that in order to open up being able to play with other people, when you first get the game, you have to kind of do some of the some of the challenges and stuff like that. So I did as many of those as I needed to do at first. And I've now opened up the ability to play with other people. So uh, Chris messaged me Saturday night and we were going to set up a race and it fell through. But so now I'm kind of I'm doing some challenges, but then also doing some online races and stuff like that. I'm if you guys mixing if, it up if you guys race can you uh i think this is easy to do now can you set it up on twitch so we can watch because i maybe you get maybe watching you guys race will convince me to uh yeah to, i think so yeah i'd go we'll to look into it but enjoy. yeah but so yeah i've been doing some challenges but i get a kind of a kick out of the online racing it's it's more fun to me to play with real people than it is the ai just because real people mess up and do dumb things and so it you know, it's not like racing a computer that's always perfect. It's, you know, it, it's people that just kind of are people. So, yeah, yeah. Although when I used to play online, it, people would just like, you know, go, go, go into a corner at a thousand miles an hour and knock everybody offline. But uh, see, if you do that in Horizon, it's actually smart that if it predicts that you're going to have a high speed collision, it ghosts your car out. Whoa, so then you really? can't hit anybody. Really? Yep. That's smart. And then yeah. so you, so basically you just screw yourself. Yeah, essentially. Uh, I like that. I like that. All right. So, well, yeah, good, it's been fun. Good, uh, good, uh, good choice uh, for Actually, driving for the week. Can I clarify something really quick? Sorry, I sure. had to look up the Mirage price because it was driving me crazy. The Mirage is a little bit cheaper than the Versa to start by like a few hundred bucks. But the Mirage that we were driving was more expensive than the Versa that I was driving. And it was still totally worse. Uh, do, do you remember how much the verse or the Mirage was? Because yeah, I think you were driving a loaded one. It was loaded. It was like Such as it is. It was almost twenty grand, I think. <laughs> oh my god, which is crazy Stop for a Mirage. It. And the Stop Versa it. was like eighteen or nineteen, and it was like ten times better. Man, so. I wonder what the Mirages are really selling for. You know, when the, the negotiation is done, they got to be like going for way, way, oh, way yeah. less than that. Um, all right, so this week I'm driving a Cadillac XT4. Um, speaking of their um, silly naming schemes. Um, this is their um, co- this is their subcompact luxury crossover. Um, I would say their compact is the uh, XT5. Um, so when I think of this size of luxury SUV, the real small ones, I immediately go to the Volvo XC40, which is I think the best in the class. And it's currently one of my favorite vehicles on sale right now. Uh, I love the XC40. I, it's a pleasure to drive. It, it looks so cool. Um, and it has every Volvo touch I love. Uh, and they're doing a lot of good things with interior design and infotainment right now. Um, so the XC4 really had a high bar when I got into it. And this is going to sound like not a compliment, but I mean it as a compliment. My first impression is that the XT4 does not fall all over itself. Um, it is, it is decent. Like it, like the it looks good from the outside. Um, the interior is designed well. 
everything works, you know, as it should. Um, and I, I would say it doesn't drive as well as the XC40. I felt like the XC40 was a little bit more fun to drive, um, but it's not bad at all. Um, the one thing about driving it is um, the sight lines are not great because the belt line, uh, you know, the, the the bottom of the windows is very high and the the back window is very small. So it definitely gives you that claustrophobic feel like you're sitting in a Camaro or something. Um, where it really falls down though, is price because I immediately hopped on the configurator and I'm like, all right, let me see how much a similarly equipped XC40 would cost. And it's like three to $5,000 less. And we're already talking about cars that are actually, I have the, I think I have the thing right here. The, the Cadillac is upper forties, um, which is really, you know, that's expensive for a subcompact crossover. Right, that's what I was thinking. Um, the, um, XC40 was about 44, 45, also expensive, but I just felt like I, oh, I'm, this is a very premium vehicle. Uh, and you, you get that feeling a little less with the XC40. Um, I had heard some negative criticism though of the XC40 and I didn't, I didn't, my experience so far does not totally match that, but it's not, it's not knocking me out of the park either. I think when I do review it and score it, it's probably going to get a pretty average score. It kind of sounds like you're damning it with faint praise, honestly. I am. I. It's hard to give Cadillac praise because it's like every every good thing you say is followed by a but these days. So um, that's the, that's the best I can do. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, you can follow Jeff on Twitter at not a boat captain. Uh, Chris is on Twitter at Chris Bruce nineteen eighty five, and you can follow me uh, at John underscore M underscore Neff. Um, I want to thank you guys for being here uh, and talking on the show with me. Yeah, thank you, John. Yep, thanks for having me. And of course, thanks everyone out there for listening. We'll talk to you next week.